Getting to know a place is one of the best parts of the adventure of travel, and you can tell a lot about an area from its craft beer scene. We speak with craft beer writers about what's worth checking out in beer cities all over the country. From visiting the can't-miss breweries in the area to checking out festivals that show beer communities at their finest, on each episode we get a better look of the local beer scene from a national perspective. Beer with Strangers starts now. Welcome to Beer with Strangers. I'm Tony Russo, and this week I'm joined by beer hauler John Russo. He happens to be my brother, but he's also in the beer industry, and he's going to join us occasionally to bring us some beer news that he thinks we need to know, and I agree. So um, welcome, John. Let me get you to introduce yourself. What do you do and that kind of thing? I work with 902 Brewing. I've been with them for five and a half years. Um, sales, uh, moving kegs, production, uh, odds and ends, sampling, sampling beers is my favorite thing. <laughs> That's your favorite part. Quality, um, yeah, quality control. Yeah. I, I want to talk about 902 for a second and I'm sorry to, I didn't notice this before, but if you could turn your microphone up two clicks. Um, so 902 has kind of bounced around for a while, but they, have a cool new spot that's open and if you'd like to talk about that i'd like to hear about it because i haven't because the world the world was ending i haven't had a chance to to visit uh sure yeah um so just quick history we were um contract brewing or gypsy brewing for uh from 2002 no sorry 2012 up until march of last year uh that's when we finalized the construction of the current brewery. We're in Jersey City. Um, we've got a 20 barrel system with six fermenters now. We're, we're pumping out uh, different beers all the time. Um, and then some of our regular beers as well are, you know, um, it's good to have a home. It's, it's, it's good to not have to go drop things off, wait for it to get brewed, right it up, bring it back unload it and then have to move it again like now we move beer once and it's out <laughs> right well and also you've got a great space you've got that rooftop which is just insane yeah it's, it's a really nice view um it's a good amount of space up there and, and and now with everything so in new jersey uh for those of you that are not familiar you have to be if you're inside you have to be six feet away from each other while seated. Um, and we can have up to 35% of our max capacity inside. Outside's a different deal. I mean, it's still six feet away, but you know, you whatever room there you have, you can use. So the rooftop right. helped, helped a lot in the beginning, uh, especially when we, we opened in the summer, um, we opened up, uh, you know, two customers on premise in like June um, or July. I don't really remember. Uh, <laughs> I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was June. Um, and it was nice to be able to like, you know, especially at that time and nobody knew, nobody kn really knows what was going on. Not that people know what's going on now. Uh, we're able to be outside and, and have some beers and, and a nice view. And you know, again, nice to have a home. And one of the things that um, we were uh, we were talking about before before we got on was uh, that now you're kind of getting ready to get into the season and like it must be insane trying to get beers into places, you know, when everything's still so up in the air. Yeah, uh, I mean, my basic strategy has been continue like pounding the places that you know already. Um, and then, you know, it's a, it's a shot in the dark. If anybody will bring you on that you haven't been in, there's less likely now than it was a year ago. Um, draft wise, I know I read this fact somewhere. I, I don't, I can't give you a, a direct, but it was like drafts, drafts down, like was down like 80 or 90%. Um, yeah. And like, it hasn't been any different for us, you know, like things are slower, uh, especially up here or we do a lot of stuff in Hudson County. Um, a lot of these places are tiny. They can't really have people in there. Like even at 35% or, you know, six feet away from the bar. And like, there's barely seven feet in the place. Right. They've got a lot of those old timey 
long, thin places down there, up there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the other things that I was interested in now that you kind of mentioned, you know, the the whole difficulty of draft is what are the rules about growlers? Like, do restaurants, can, can bars now give growlers as well? Do you guys benefit from being able to give growlers? Uh, that's that's another, another thing that's changed, uh, especially at restaurants. Um, they've been able to do a lot of to-go, which mm-hmm. has been allowed ever. Um, and actually, I know in Hoboken it was a problem because people were like getting to-go and then walking up and down uh, Washington Avenue, and <laughs> just, everyone's just drinking. And they were like, "Wait, we got we got So they, I think they, they went back and forth so many times. I don't even know what's allowed now. Um, I know a lot of places. We're using the growlers. Uh, I don't know what their process was as far as um, were they cleaning them or were they ex- like just exchanging them. Right. Uh, I know people have certain growlers that are like, oh, I don't want to lose this because I got this out and God knows where. And you know, I could. I I know some places were not doing like you had to buy the growler um, or exchange it that they weren't using your growlers. And this is again in the beginning. Can can people just bring their own growler to nine oh two now and leave with it or um I don't know. I don't work enough on premise. Uh and I honestly I feel like most people like we have a growler machine, so most people will just take that. It's a lot easier. Um and I and we have them available. Like we have growlers available for sale. Um but I, I'm not sure. I'm I'm gonna guess that they would do it, but I, I, that's okay. Let me let me uh, let me interrupt you. You have a growler machine. That's so cool. What yeah. is that like? Um, it's. I'm sorry. You said crowler with a C. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've seen those. I thought yeah. you meant you had like a. No. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. The. Uh, you know, everyone knows the the crowlers. They actually. Um, there was a couple bars especially like the bigger craft beer bars went out and would, were like, they bought their own crawlers, um, crawling machine rather. Uh, so we saw like some of our like off stuff was getting taken. Uh, like we had, we had kegs of seltzer. This one place just takes our kegs of, of seltzer and he, he like rocks out crawlers and Hoboken of our seltzer. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. Like a very particular, but and so we're all caught up with that, but I do want to get to the um, the news of of the week. So why don't you start with that first story that we wanted to talk about, Anchor Brewing and their new um, labels? Um, yeah, they 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 completely are rebranding. Um, and from when I when I read it was. Uh, just a matter of their stuff, their their beers weren't getting caught, like they weren't uh, eye catching anymore. So they wanted to revamp. Um, the The labels are brighter, mm-hmm. a little more. Their 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 steam beer, which was like that uh, pale, very pale yellow, is more like a I don't know neon, not really neon, but bright. well, they're they're. I mean, I think it's had the same the same label for like a thousand years or something, something absurd. You know, it's, yeah. it's been a, it's been a really long time that they've had the same label. And when you make those kind of changes, you know, it is a little, it's a little scary because you're like, people aren't going to see it. Um, what I wonder though about anchor is that there are people um, like a brand that big people are looking for it. Hmm. Very much in the same way that like people look for, for example, Budweiser. Like it's it's that kind of iconic. Like try to get their Christmas sale in November and forget about it, right? If you don't get it the day it hits the stores, you're yeah. often out of luck. Um, and so when you have something like that, it's got to be tough to change. But I guess. They're also saying that no one is saying, oh, I wonder what this beer is. You know, so you have people who've been drinking Anchor forever who always grab it. Like, I'll grab Steam, I don't know, one out of ten times. 
easily i'll grab it uh they don't have a cold in my place that's <laughs> i would grab it more often if they kept it cold which is very frustrating i don't know i don't know what you have to do to get do to get your beer cold in a place but it's tough man we have we have a lot of customers that are just like they don't they won't keep it cold like they're like, oh, well, it doesn't, in their mind, it doesn't need to be cold because, like, our beer doesn't need to be cold because Anchor beer doesn't need to be cold. It's like, no, you're, you're like, you're, you're missing the point. <laughs> but you can keep the shitty beer warm. Because <laughs> people will drink it anyway. You know, I, that's, that's always been a huge frustration for me. I mean, some people buy, some, many people buy Bud by the six pack, but that's a beer that you, you often buy by the more than six pack. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have it cold in the back. You don't also need it cold in the front. Like no one's going to come in and say, well, I guess they don't have Budweiser. I'll go someplace else. Well, you say that, but uh, Coors, Coors Light had a, had a problem earlier this year. They, they couldn't keep their their beers uh, on the shelves. They had a, the, there was a canning issue, I think, for them. Um, All right, well. Oh, oh, oh. yes yes uh, when, when there's when there's not when there's not a distribution problem related to a global pandemic most people are not going to say well i guess they don't have budweiser you know they'll say hey where's the budweiser and what's frustrating to me is there are a lot of times when i'm like i want to try a new beer and then i want to try it now you know i don't want to try it in four hours you know i don't want to plan i'm sorry i often do want to plan to have a beer for that reason, like, I'll be like, okay, well, I'm probably going to want a beer to tonight. Let me go see what there is if I want to get it cold. But if I don't go, then I'm going to grab whatever's cold because I want it now. You know, increasingly, I, I can't complain. They've had a lot of, they've had a dead guy ale on, uh, in, in the cold box. And, and last year I made an appeal for them to put founders at least in the cooler. They didn't have it in the in the glass section mm -hmm. but if you knew to go in the back yeah. it was in the walk-in cooler and there were always five cases there i always took one and there were always five when i came back or you know yeah so I'm, people I'm, were buying it i'm seeing more more places do that where they have a hey we have cold beer in here come check it out you know like a whole area of you know, it's not on, it's not in the glass case. It's not behind the door. You like, you have to walk in this section. And I think that's, you know. Well, it's better. I mean, uh, the place by me has so many beers and they could put two six packs of each in that back and it would be perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I would try a beer that I hadn't tried if it were cold. Yeah. I, I actually, when this weekend we were having, we were having dinner and I got, I went to get two six packs and i wanted to try this german dunkel and it was warm and i'm like you know what i want that now or i don't want it at all so i'm gonna go get dead gael but they also had it cold so they had it warm and cold mm. which is another somebody's not getting that space and i don't think they think of it like you're taking space by having something in two places you're having one less beer and that's always very frustrating for me mm. uh I, I'm sorry that you were going to comment on that. Well, I, I, I ran into a guy recently who does, uh, he's, he has one, if you, if he has your beer, it's cold, warm and broken up. So you have single, the four pack warm and then cold four pack. Right. Which is an interesting idea, except the beer should be cold. <laughs> <laughs> like we, if have, you... we have a milkshake IPA. That's, that's going to, I just, you know, came to mind. I was like, it's going to be sitting, uh, sitting warm on a shelf. I'm like, and and again if you're if you're planning that's unfortunate you know it's like i guess they think if you're planning to have a beer event then you're going to come and pick out this beer but it's very frustrating that it's not clear that people just want to grab a six pack of decent beer on their way home sometimes and god bless them like at my store you can get evo which is the biggest regional brand and then you can get a samuel adams product which includes dogfish head uh, and then you can get you know bigger beers you know they don't have a lot of the locals a, a lot of the local stuff is on the shelf and 
you know, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to wait. Yeah. Um, I, I was, I was fortunate enough actually to speak with Scott Ungerman. I, I actually looked it up. It doesn't have the episode. There's not an episode number here, but it's Scott Ungerman from Anchor Brewing in one of our earlier episodes. It's an episode from June, 2019, back when people were traveling to drink beer. And he told me some great stories about the very thing we're talking about. We were talking earlier about the, the labels and he, he was talking about how, you know, there's like a balance you have to strike when you take up a, a kind of iconic brand where, you know, you want to be able to do something with it, but you can't walk in the door and saying, you know, I think, you know, steam is not hoppy enough. Right. <laughs> or, or maybe, maybe we should do, something different with stout, you know, that there are some brands you can't touch, but he was saying it gives you the opportunity to be more creative in other ways. So what, when we were talking about the story occurred to me was that maybe that's what's behind this kind of change in the label. Like we know you like anchor steam, but let's see if we can trick you into trying something new because we're also making new stuff. We're not just making, you know, anchor steam and the Christmas. Uh, I didn't get a Christmas six pack this year. I was so disappointed. Mm -hmm. I walked in the store and I saw them and I'm like, I got to make sure I come back and grab one. And three days later they were gone. Yeah. And, and I'm like, who, who bought them all? I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for those to go that quickly, why, why do you still have Budweiser behind, you know, 12 panels of, of glass? You know, it, if everyone comes in and grabs this the second it comes out, you know, well, some, how, some of that's an allotment um, with the distributor. You know, if you don't buy X amount of beer during the year, you only get, you know, four cases of Christmas beer. That's fine. But if you sell four cases of Christmas beer in a day and a half, I feel like it should occur to you that there are more craft beer drinkers looking for good beer than you think. You know, and again, I'm not saying that Samuel Adams products aren't good beer. I'm just saying that people have a wider taste still than than they're given credit for. You know, it's weird that it used to be that they would take a chance on something like 60 minute IPA, you know, and now like they're taking a chance on dead guy ale, you know, like the odds are in your favor. If you if you put it in there and it's cold, people will buy it. You know, I would just like to see a better allotment of space um, among the retailers. You know, because people are going to try it. You know, there are still enough people who are willing to try enough things that you could devote a little bit more space to non-traditional brands. Right. That's my hope. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I try to tell people. All right. Well, let's go on to the second story. I'm sorry that we dragged that out yeah. so much. Um, this is an ancient brewing store that you came up with. And well, uh, if, if anyone come up with it, <laughs> well, that, that, that you decided you'd like to talk about. It. And if anyone's been following this for any period of time, yeah. and I'm glad I didn't say anything too nasty about dogfish head. <laughs> um, ancient ales have been a really big topic here. Um, my first co-host, Doug Griffith, um, was one of the first people to brew the ancient ales, uh, that Dogfish had started putting out. He was the one who came up with the homebrew recipes that were eventually put into the book that became extreme brewing. And it was, it was always a real sort it was, it was a greater source of pride for me, I believe, than it was for Doug, but I don't care because he just genuinely got a kick out of brewing these uh, meaty beers, you know, and um, and so I, I've got a lot of backstory on it. But let's let's start with the four story. So what's what's going on with the uh, ancient uh, ancient Dale? I haven't I didn't find a lot other than, you know, the. uh what the layout is like, you know, it, they've got, uh, uh, they were making a, when they were brewing, they were brewing 5,000 gallons at a time. All right. Well, let's go back. We're talking about 
Oh, sorry. Is, uh, Egypt? Uh, Egypt. Yeah, in Egypt, Ab Abydos, A-B-Y-D-O-S. I'm assuming that's how you say it. Uh, this is believed to have been working 5,000 years ago under King... Can't read, read my handwriting. Uh, King uh, Norma. King Norma. Uh, it's the oldest. It's believed to be the oldest high production brewery in the world. Um, 5,000 gallons is a lot. So, for example, how, what do you guys brew? Um, we do, you know, 40 barrels or, or 20 barrels. Um, a barrel is 30 gallons-ish. Um, so, uh, that math is uh, 30 times. 1,200, I believe. Yeah, so... At one clip, they were doing <laughs> five, five, five times. Right? That's that. That's huge. Now, did they have this in like? How big was the brewery? Was it set out? Like, was everything very close together? They made it seem like it was set up similar to the way a brewery would have it now, where it's like you know things weren't too far from each other, and that the um, where it was physically located was near uh, burial sites. And because, the, I guess, a lot of drinking went on during right. burial rituals. So, like, you know, you don't have to, ex you know, transport your beer that far. You just stick your head under the faucet. <laughs> well, and this would have been like an open fermentation, like what we would call today an open fermentation system. Yeah, I would assume so. Uh, from these the pictures I'm seeing here, it doesn't look uh, you know, like a lot of this is enclosed. But I mean, sort of withered away. Or um, it's amazing how they come across these things sometimes. It's like you know. the fact that the the picture that I'm seeing is so open, and they're like, "How am I just getting this news now?" Like they didn't just find this. They didn't just oh we well they maybe we maybe it's. <laughs> It's possible that they found something new. A lot of times with, with especially historical digs, every time they find something new, it's an opportunity to retell the entire, the entire story, you know, but um, you know, if, if anyone would like to try Midas touch, that is uh, that's probably the kind of beer that was made in there. One of the things that I think is super cool about the prevailing or the last prevailing theory I heard about the development of beer was this idea that it was an accident that uh, people had found essentially a, a leak in a jar allowed water to ferment barley um, completely by accident. And they liked the way it tasted when they drank the water. And so they just kept trying to replicate it and I think about how much time a person has to have on their hands, you know, to come up with not only to figure the process out, but then to be able to go from we found a jar with water in it to 5,000 gallons. Yeah. <laughs> and an industry, you know? Yeah, I'm really interested in, in like, what was this process like for them? Like I, I don't I don't brew for for the record I I'm not a brewer uh, I know a little bit about it but I've never done it um, so I, I don't I don't know but I, I I have an idea and for them to make five thousand gallons of beer like you have to heat it up and I know it's Egypt so it might be a little bit easier to do there um, I, I'm just interested in what that process was like you know how 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 did they do it. Well, I, one of the things that, you know, we, we know from just the monks is that when you don't have a really good, when you don't have anything else to do, 24 hour shifts aren't weird, you know? So if you have so many people just working in complete shifts and, um, you know, just switching and switching and constantly, dragging in wood for the <laughs> you're right just dragging in wood to keep the water boiling you know uh that is 
it's an it's an it's an amazing feat now. You know, like if I had to brew five thousand gallons of beer with just clay pots and you know, because that's the other thing, right? I don't know. They must have been malting, right? So there's another story in our future where they find a malt house because how much malt do you need for 5,000 gallons of beer to ferment? Mm. You know, that's, that's an entire other industry. And the idea that so many people are committed to just producing this one thing, um, you know, so like you said, so you're a 40 barrel so twice the size of the brewery, three, th almost three times the size of 902 is What's a, a one beer. <laughs> right. And yeah. And they, there wasn't a choice. This is, we have beer flavored beer. <laughs> what do you have on tap? We have beer on tap. <laughs> don't, don't make me add you to the, to the big, uh, to the big pile of, uh, of wood we're about to burn. Um, but the other thing that's always kind of amazed me about the ancient ales and about brewing generally, because it still happens, is just it gets better because people people get bored. You know, we're, I was just talking about the guy at Anchor, right? Like, you know, I, I know several people who have worked at Dogfish Head um, and they leave once they get high enough to quote, not get to brew unquote anymore. You know, once, once it becomes too much of the hands off process, uh, they, I'm sorry. And, and also I, it should be said that they have a, uh, the company has a test, a test batch and anyone who works at dogfish head can go down and make their own beer. They can invent their own beer and they can brew their own 10 gallons of anything at any time. You just sign up for it. And that's fun to do. But if you're a lot of the brewers that leave there and start their own breweries just want to still tweak and tweak and tweak. And when I was speaking with Scott Ungerman, you know, that's what he was talking about. He was saying how hard it is to just shake off this idea that you're going to tweak anything. You can come up with new stuff. You know, and you can do the Christmas beer is different every year, but you you're not tweaking, you know, no one at Dogfish Head's tweaking 60 minute IPA. No one's tweaking, you know, uh, hell or uh, hell or high, high water, hell or Hoboken. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it gets tweaked. <laughs> We're still young. It's still still <laughs> but the, the the point is the beers that are no one's no one's tweaking Brady's nightmare, I guess. is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh but there are, there are just some things it's like, you know, people have this expectation and you can't undermine that, but you can do something new. But as the breweries get bigger, you know, a lot of the brewers are like, well, I want to do something new more often. Hmm. And that's great. And it's just, that's how you get from a found can of wet barley to a 5,000 barrel 5,000 gallon brew system um 5,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago whatever whatever you said it was 5,000 5, years ago 3,000 BC, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating to me um so do you have any events or anything that are coming up we're getting ready to wind up here what's going on at 902 what's going on with you uh they they have uh you have to check out their their site to see what's going on in the tap room uh, I know in the future they're they're looking to have uh, AC beer fest is supposed to happen. It's gonna be outside. Uh, I've got another outside event planned May twenty second in English Town at the uh, racetrack. I don't know. I don't know. I don't Hope know. springs eternal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone's everyone's very optimistic, but you know. And where can people find you socially? Uh, my Instagram is ham malls beer with two m's ham malls beer and uh i'm on twitter but i don't do anything and i uh that's really the scope of things <laughs> fantastic well you can find me at by tony russo on twitter you can also find uh the show at brw strangers on twitter 
it's just notification that this show has come up though. So I don't know how desperately you need to see it, but if you'd like to follow some of the articles that we've written, you can follow us on um, state of the beer at state of the beer on Twitter. And of course you can go to the state of the beer website. where We'll have the opportunity to, sh- to sign up for our newsletter, which is uh, bi monthly. Um, we send out little, like I'll, I'll send out uh an email about this show and just about different things that are, that are going on with the show. And that's pretty much all I have for this week. So until next time, remember drink what you like and be happy. All right. We'll see you folks. Beer with strangers was produced mostly by dumb luck. If you have a recipe pairing or brewery you think we should know about, reach out to us on stateofthebeer.com. If you like the show, please make sure you subscribe. And if you really like it, tell someone else who you think might like it as well. The state of the beer is strong.